Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you once again for slotting in. I'm excited to share with you from Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to talk a little bit about the effect that the gospel has on, or what it had on the early church. We're going to look a little bit at the history and what was going on in Rome at that time, and what Christianity was in the time of Rome. Uh, Who were the Christians? How did they live? What was different when it came to Christianity? Uh, What impact did Christianity have in the world back then? And then we're going to look at how that impacts our lives. Now, I want to start out by saying that you can expect the power of heaven to form and shape your life. Sadly, for many years in Christianity, the gospel was preached as a message where Jesus gave us a second chance so that we can go to heaven, instead of the power of heaven that has come to the earth to save us from the destruction that is in this world. And if you would know how things were going in um, in the times of Rome and the, the suffering that people were under because of immorality that was going on in the world and just the way their culture functioned and you could see what came forth in Christianity. It was truly a salvation. It was a salvation from destruction. It was a de- salvation from a lot of pain and heartache. Uh, yes, there was persecution for the church, but it was, I would say, to a certain degree, even worse just to be a normal Roman back then, if you would think of what the, the circum- circumstances that they lived in and what was called normal in that day and age. Just imagine that you had to worship all the gods. You had you were, you were not allowed to say that you're not worshiping a certain god. You had to embrace what was going on in that time. And that was law. You had to worship all the gods. You had to pay homage to all the gods. Uh, imagine making and offering your children and your wife to be part of the ritualistic practices that was going on in that day. And all of a sudden there is now a religion that is coming um, and bringing forth a life where you don't have to share your wife with someone else, where you don't have to share your children with someone else, where you don't have to. Uh, and, and one of the ways when you show dominance as a leader of the family and of over your slaves, how to have sex with your slave to show dominance and those kind of things. There's a great salvation that came through Christianity. And in the very same way, through Christianity, we today are being saved and will still be saved from many things that just brings unnecessary hurt and harm and pain into this world. I think sad it's a sad thing to to narrow Christianity down to where you go when you die. It is absolutely powerless. The only power that there is in that would be that you don't want to go and burn forever in hell and that you now are simply going to use your own willpower so that you keep yourself out of hell trying to serve the Lord and do the right thing. But if we can realize that salvation is that God has come to save us from the death that is inside this world, from the destruction that is in this world, to provide a safe place for us, a place where we can have the mind of God, where we can truly think logically, where we can see things for what it is and live in the peace that is offered uh, from God to us, to have the creation of heaven in our lives, where we can have peace for our children, where we can have peace for, uh, you know, for our families, where we can truly share a life of love and respect and kindness towards one another, which was something that didn't really exist in the time of Rome. Now, I want to just read from Ephesians chapter 4, verse, now just with a little bit of that in mind, let's read Ephesians 4 verse 31, then I'm going to go into chapter 5 and I'm going to read about 10 or 12 verses. It says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and railing be put away from you with all malice, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, even as God also forgave uh, also in Christ forgave you. So what he's saying here is simply, look at the life of heaven, which is demonstrated in Jesus. Let us look at the power of forgiveness that came through Jesus. Jesus is the demonstration of the Father. 
He's showing who God is. He is the image of the one and only God. The one and only true God, God our Father, has come and brought forth his image in the earth to the point that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. And now we can behold the eternal order of heaven or a life that has no beginning and no end, the kind of life that is forever. And we see that life lived towards us by God in Christ Jesus. And now we find Paul using that as a point of reference, and he is now saying, look at the life that has now come towards you. You have now, by this act of God in Christ, in his death and in his resurrection, you have access to his life, and he's giving you his life. So now, uh, what Paul is saying here, he says, let bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and railing be put away from you with malice and be kind to one another. Why is how, how is that put away from us? It's put away from us in this, that God in Christ has come to deliver us from that. So what he's basically saying to them here is count yourself not as a person that is prone to bitterness. Count yourself as a person that is not open for wrath. That means to bring death over someone, someone's life, or you are not a person anymore that is bound by anger and just clamor or fighting, put this away from you with all malice. In other words, how do we put it, do we put it, put it away from us? The very same way as what a person in South Africa that was under the apartheid system and oppressed when he was said that you are just a black person and you are not the same as a white person and so forth, the very same way wherein he puts that away from him in the new South Africa. He simply says, that is not who I am. What, was, what I was told I am, I am not that anymore because of the new that has come. In the very same way, if you would think of Kim Jong-un, uh, the leader of North Korea, and you would think of that country becoming free from dictatorship. And let's say they uh, they get their freedom and they're not called North Korea anymore, they're just called Korea now. And South Korea is not called South Korea anymore, it's just Korea. You will find that the person that was in North Korea, the way he puts um, the old away from him would be simple. He would simply say, I am not that because I'm under a new jurisdiction. I'm under a new rule. And he will face the truth and he will accept the truth. And this is what Paul is doing here. He's simply saying, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and railings be put away from you with all malice. And then he says what the new kind of life looks like, the life of heaven that has come our way, the, the reality of the order of heaven, the kind of people we now are in the, under the rulership of Christ. He says, be kind one to another, tender-hearted. Obviously, Paul is addressing here fighting that would be between different people groups. We also need to understand that Paul had to bring these corrections in the church because you would find a people that basically would be Bacchus worshippers and they would come and now believe that Jesus is Lord and then they will come to a church meeting. But they didn't know how to live in the presence of God or a God, they would just know, well, if you kind of feel the presence of the Lord, which would in the church would be the presence of the Holy Spirit, what they would do is they would start to shout and make noise and go, it would just be chaotic because that was their reference on how they worshipped the God. They were still the worshippers of Bacchus. And what you would say to a Bacchus worshipper that is now coming to uh, the church and the worshippers of Bacchus, they knew that, you know, the way you worship Bacchus is you get drunk. And now they come to the church and every Sunday there is communion. They see some wine and some bread and they say, well, here's the party, let's get drunk. And uh, they would then, in Bacchus worship, they would pray in different kinds of tongues, you know, which was not the tongues um, that we have in Christianity, but it would simply be this... Uh, going kind of outside of yourself in a crazy frenzy. They would have that kind of a thing in the church. And then what would the church people say? He says, no, we want to just tell you in where we are here, there's order. If someone prays in tongues, it's two or three with an interpreter. 
and we don't get drunk at the communion. That is not what we do here. It's not about drunkenness. It's about celebrating the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not to get yourself into a frenzy. So he, they would teach the people who they are, how the order of heaven worked, because they were dealing with people that didn't know uh, this order as what we basically know now in a broad spectrum, even outside of Christianity, because of the influence that Christianity had in the world. So he says here, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, even as God also in Christ forgave you. And be therefore imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, even as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, and offering the sacrifice to God for an odor of sweet smell. Now, uh, this very same concept is used and Paul takes the same truth if you go and read Romans chapter 12 where he said, be transformed by the renewal of your mind, you know, um, and then he pleads to them by the mercies of God, which he then explains in chapter 11 as uh, God having mercy on Jew and Gentile. And then as the new people of God, not to live from the perspective of division, where you see this guy's a Jew and that one is a Gentile. And the context of Romans was that the Gentiles were now trying to oppress the Jews in this sense that they were saying God rejected the Jews because they didn't believe, but the, they accepted us. That means we are now special in our flesh. And he's saying, listen, the reason why you are accepted, if you go and read chapter 11, is simple, is that God came to have mercy on sinners, and yes, the Jews were seen as sinners because of what they've done, and you were sinners, so that God, and he concluded everyone under sin, so that he can have mercy on all. So now, please see that uh, Jew and Gentile were all in the same sinking ship, all were dying and now use that logic, the logic that God came in Christ to have mercy on all so that now you can say, well, one thing we all have in common and that is by our own power, we are just sinners and we are all dying. But one thing we do have in common is that mercy was shown unto all of us. And this is what he's simply saying. He's saying that, uh, you know, we can now live from that perspective where we walk in love as Christ Christ loved us and gave himself for us. So what he is saying is, is the life that we have now been raised up into, one of the attributes of it is to give yourself to others. Why would we give ourselves to others? Because we have abundance of life. We've got eternal life. We don't lack life. So if we give away from ourselves to others, that thing that we give away, be it some money or some time, or if we maybe humble ourselves and say, well, you know, we humble in this area. Why do we do that? We do it from the power of the eternal life that has now come to dwell in us through the Holy Spirit combined with the awareness that that is true, facing the truth, and then we mentally ordering ourselves, knowing who and what we truly are, as what we would expect from a person that would, in the new South Africa, order himself and know and face the truth about who he now is in the new South Africa, saying, this is who I am, face the truth. Now, imagine the truth of what happened when apartheid was ended, or imagine the truth if North Korea would get its freedom. Uh, how much more the truth of Jesus Christ being raised from the dead and the power of heaven that has now come to earth? And this is what Paul is using here. He's simply saying, face the truth. This is who you are. And then he mentions now, uh, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named amongst you as becomes as becomes saints. So what he's saying is, is you are saints, and saints would mean, in this case, being set apart as the people of the kingdom of God that is being established by God in the earth, where the order of God's love and grace has now come to the earth. And the beauty of it is that we don't just look at the order of God and the life of God uh, in the life of Jesus from the perspective of doing window shopping. It is from the perspective of it being the life that now is born in us and shapes us and forms us. He says, you are saints, and this is what becomes saints. This is what is right for saints. 
So this is not a thing where when he's trying to say, listen, these are the things you need to do in order to go to heaven. No, he's, he's coming from a different perspective. He's basically saying, and you will see as we continue, he's saying that is the life that belongs to the world. That is the godless life has that fruit. But you now, in the life of God that has come to the earth, those things should not even be named among you. In other words, there's a brand new identity for you. There's a brand new way of living. So the old man with its works, in other words, the old man in this case would refer to, let's say, the worshippers of Bacchus or to be a Roman or to be a Greek or to say just you're a Jew. The old man with its practices, you need to understand that back in those days, fornication was part of the average normal Roman practice on how males especially lived in that time. Covetousness was at the order of the day, as what I would say it is today. It's at the order of the day. You know, it's just the more I can have, that is what it is all about. And what he's saying now is in the kingdom of God, because we are complete in Christ, because that is the truth, we don't have to covet life, we don't have to covet for anything, because we are in the mindset that the fullness of God has come unto us, and that is true, and that is real. And that's why I say that covetous not even be named amongst you. Back in those days, you know, um, there was a, a life of uncleanness, you know, where uh, people truly lived a rough life. And he's now saying, you are now in a new kingdom, there's a new domain and a new rule. And he was introducing the people to who you are in Christ and how the order of heaven looks in this world. Paul got his order of heaven from the Old Testament. In other words, there were some of the rules and laws, if you want to call it rules and laws, or order, or a way in which the kingdom looks, that he got from the Old Testament, which was things like care for the widows and the orphans and so forth. But he could see, and he got it from a combination on seeing how God dealt with us in Christ. So he would say, the life that comes from heaven in Jesus was one which was not full of filthiness. Jesus didn't live that life. The way he lived was in respect towards other people. He was a giver. He multiplied the bread. He always gave to the poor. He was a person that would be kind to sinners. He was a person that would live a life uh, that was not sexually immoral and so forth. Then he would have a lot of teachings, you know, as, as, uh, uh, if you go and read in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And he would look at what Jesus would teach and he would look at how Jesus lived. And then he would look at the unification of heaven and earth and from there extrapolate what the life is that belongs to us. He would then preach it as a new life that belongs to us. He would basically preach it as heaven coming to earth and what heaven on earth looks like. And then we would look at that and identify with the truth. I think Paul preached it to the, in, in a way that should a person not live that life, it would be frowned upon in, in this sense that it is you are delusional as pertaining to who you are. That is what it would be. It would be equivalent to somebody thinking that he is a dog. You know, it's like you live as a dog, but you're a human. You know, it's like not right. It is crazy. It's not supposed to be that way. Uh, it would be, and I see, I see sometimes, you know, we find that even happening. I don't know if it's still happening, but I, I've uh, read that there's some places in schools in America where they now have litter boxes for children that think they are cats. It is crazy. It's, it's frowned upon. It is you are out of your mind. It's a serious sickness. You need help. And I think that is the kind of a thing that Paul was thinking to a certain degree, maybe not as with those strong words, but he was truly thinking of who he is and who we are in our unification with the resurrected Christ, for we've now become one flesh with him. 
We are united with him. The order of heaven has now united with us. And Christianity, in Christianity, you are truly seeing who the Christ is, what eternal life looks like, and we know that we are heirs of eternal life. It's been given to us, and that we are now born from God, and as we are born from him, his life is, is in us. So that's why I would say, uh, neither let filthiness nor foolish talking or jesting, which is uh, not benefiting, be in you, but rather the giving of thanks. You know, so he would look at the at, at Jesus and how Jesus would give thanks. He would look at the thankfulness that's in the heart on account of uh, what God has done, and then he would minister that to people. So I hope you can see how strong this is towards identity and who you are as the people of God being delivered from the death that's in this world. For this you know for surety that no fornicator nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of God and of Christ. So he's simply saying that the people that live like this and in his mind he was thinking of the people that are worshipping idols. They don't have any inheritance in the kingdom of God. God. And uh, the lifestyle of the idol worshippers, the lifestyle of the typical people of that day, was a, a, a people that were fornicators, unclean, covetous, idolaters, the lovers of money. These people, because they're worshipping idols, and that is the lifestyle that they have that surrounds idol worship. They have no inheritance in the kingdom of God. But you now that have come to have an inheritance in the kingdom of God, um, you know, I don't want you to be deceived, he says in the next verse. He says, let no man deceive you with empty words because of these things that's happening there, this idol worship and the life that there is, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. Now, what is Paul saying there? He's simply saying, uh, and I'm going to just use as simple words as possible to explain this very difficult concept because, I mean, it is, uh, we don't want to hear anything about the wrath of God. But let me explain wrath. Wrath is when God said uh, to Adam and Eve that if a human wants to live by his own power, and I'm using my own words now, God knowing that it would bring forth a lot of pain and hurt as what you would look at the Genesis chapter 6, there was a lot of uh, hurt and pain in the earth on account of the wickedness of man that was in the earth. Children were being raped. There was absolute death going on. I wouldn't even say death. It's just pain and hurt and destruction in the earth. Now, God said that he has put an expiry date on that kind of a life, and that is called the wrath of God. That would mean that there will be a time in this world where that would completely not exist anymore. And that would then include those who want that life and embrace it even until the end. So what God is simply saying is, is what we would say today. If we would look at the atrocities that's happening in the world, the, 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 the abuse that's happening in the world, God would say, of that death, you will die. It's going to die out. So God was basically saying that he's going to protect the earth through his wrath. That would be that he would offer freedom from death in Christ, but this system where there's pain, he has put an expiry date on that and said the end of that will be death. So God would not give eternal life to destruction or to hurt or to pain. Imagine you would have somebody like Adolf Hitler that could live and exist forever, never die. Now, God said that life where you live by yourself will end in death. And then when death entered the world, God offered the Christ so that whosoever is saying that I don't want to die, I want to be washed from that life, and I want your life, God, that they can have access to eternal life. Yet, it remains true. The wrath of God remains true, meaning that there's death for that system and whosoever wants to be part of it. That is what it means, and that is where that's why we would find one of the definitions in the Hebrew that the wrath of God is God's passionate love to deliver from death, and that is what has happened in Jesus. Okay, so I don't want to preach all teaching on that. I don't want to get too complicated. You'll have to go and listen to this again. 
It says, let no man deceive you because through empty words, because of these things come the wrath of God on the sons of disobedience. Be not therefore partakers with them, for you were darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of the light is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is well-pleasing unto God. I hope you can see the identity thing here again in verse 8. He says clearly, for you are... Are you were once darkness. Now he's referring to how these people live that were idol worshippers, the worshippers of Bacchus, what we saw in the opening of the um, Olympic Games. Absolute turmoil. The it, it just blows your mind on on what the flesh can bring forth. It, it just blows your mind. And what blows my mind even more is the embrace of that by the church trying to say we are inclusive. You just don't know who you are. You need to repent and get your mind into what God has done in Christ and who the new person is. We can clearly say, and I, I, I've got absolute time for a person that might be bound by certain uh, fruit of the flesh and so forth. Let's say there's a person that struggles with uh, love for money, for instance, or lying. What will we do in the church? What will I do in our church pastorally? I would welcome that person into the church and I would walk a path with that person. And I've got a lot of time uh, for a person that is struggling yet acknowledging that there is freedom in Christ and wanting it. We can walk for years with such a person, but the moment that person says that this way of living is endorsed by God and also celebrated by God, that is the point where I would say, I don't think there's place for you, you know, with me. Now, you might say, Bertie, that is, well, I would not just say in one second, just get lost, but I would say, listen, I'm differing from you now. This is not what the gospel teaches. This is not the life of heaven. This is not the order of heaven. And uh, so I want to just say how I see it in Dynamic Love Ministries and in our local fellowship, what we see along those lines. And I want you to hear me out because you know me for a very long time. I'm not a judgmental person. I don't want anybody to be pushed away. Yet we cannot in the church embrace the way of the world because God has come to save us from that and we want freedom from that. Let's say you're a person that struggles with um, pornography. Should we now in the church say, since you struggle with pornography, that and we welcome the person that struggle with pornography, or let's say we've got somebody that makes pornography, uh, 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 porn, makes videos, he now start to believe in Jesus. Should we now say, well, we accept this person the way he is and we, we've, we're tolerant and um, we, we are, everybody's accepted in Christ so he can continue as long as what he gives his tithe from the money that he's making? No. We will introduce that person to Christ. And we will say the order of heaven is not an order where someone is abused, but where you give yourself for the well-being of someone else. We will teach him the holiness of sex, where God has chosen to have sex as the symbol of the unification between God and man, where we talk about becoming one flesh. So sex is not anymore something where you are just using it for, to, to satisfy lust. It is now sanctified. It is holy for a certain purpose where it is the type and the shadow and the spreading of the message of the unification between one God and one people forever for life. That is what we will say. And then we will point to that person the hurt and the pain and the abuse that is going on. People's children are being stolen from them. Look at the hurt and the pain. And we are here to see these people as free. Therefore, we are introducing you to a new life. You cannot make these movies anymore as a Christian. And the power of heaven is there. And the church is here. We'll provide money for you so that you can stop this. That is what we will do. And the same for any other 
kind of a fruit of the flesh that is mentioned. And yes, if that person may be struggling and he's getting out of his business and it's taking a month to do that or whatever, the church is there pastorally to care and help, but not to give in and say that is right. We will never say that. Right. Um, well, let me put it this way. Paul would never have said that. It's a sad thing for me to see that the church today has become so liberal in their way of thinking that they have to distantiate themselves from Paul or from the New Testament or rewrite the Bible. You cannot do that. Well, if you want to, I don't say you cannot do it. You can do it. But I don't think that is right. That is not the way it's supposed to be. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 9, it says, For the fruit... The fruit of light is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is well-pleasing. It says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather prove them. For the things which are done by them in secret is a shame even to speak of. And we will have to speak a little bit on that today and what that was. But all things, when they are reproved, are made manifest by the light, for everything that is made manifest is light. Wherefore, he says, Awake you that sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ shall shine on you. Look therefore carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time. So what he's saying here, he says, You have now become light. You were darkness, but now you are light. Light, And that's what I want to say to all of you. And I think that's what we need to know as the church. When I get up in the morning and when I think, especially as I've been studying this out, uh, reading this so many times, I can't tell you how many times I've read through this and looked at this. Uh, it's beautiful to think of it because I start to think of myself as light. And light defined in this passage is that God has come and removed darkness from me He's now brought forth the power of the resurrection in me. And now the new life I live, which is the order of heaven producing God's life in me, is now making manifest that the other way of living is darkness and that that way of idol worship and everything is darkness. So the manifestation of life in us is then light. We don't have to try and be light. We are light because of the work of God. And that's how as we grab that and hold hold onto that we find that change of life that true identity uh, change and the manifestation that takes place we don't identify with um bacchus where we don't identify with uh caesar worship or any of those kind of things we identify with the resurrected christ and the life of heaven that has come which is full of kindness and goodness now i want us to go and have a look at just the way Things were going back in the day in Rome. Now, <clears throat> Christianity, when it comes to marriage, and we will talk about marriage more in depth in next Sunday's message, it says here that it emphasized on a monogamous lifelong marriage between one man and one woman. And that was a radical departure from the Roman acceptance of various sexual relationships. We need to un understand that in the time of Rome, they had uh, concubinage, which was you, you had a head of a household, the head of that household, and this was common, this was accepted in the day. The head of the household was an absolute ruler and a dictator. His wife was almost, it wasn't, she wasn't property, but almost like property. Uh, and he had this very, very powerful rulership wherein he would show his dominance through sex. That is how they lived. In other words, if... You, sex was not something as what we would see it today, as something that was about romance. Now, obviously, it would have been in cert between certain people to a certain extent, but the social norm was not that. The social norm was uh, rulership, dominancy, to be dominant. 
In other words, it was not so much about pleasure. Uh, the man showed his dominance in having sex. It was not about the pleasure of the wife or a celebration of a union between husband and wife wherein they would say our union is a message and is a celebration of the union between God and man where we are reminded in a very close to our skin way that we have become one flesh with the Christ and with God. It's, it wasn't in that sanctity. No, it was a dominance. In other words, if you had a, a worker, a slave that worked for you and you wanted to show your dominance, one of the ways was you go and have sex with him and show him who's boss. That's what happened. That's the thing that Paul would say is a shame not, and should not even be mentioned. We cannot even talk about that in public. You know, when I studied this out and I read it to my wife, just by reading what was taking place, Ileana says, no, that's enough. I don't want to hear anymore on what they did. One of the things they did, which was accepted in Roman society, was that older men could have younger boys prior to maturity as sex objects. That's nothing wrong with it. It's normal. It's just the way it works. It's part of life. And it was celebrated and motivated for men to have sex with a lot of women. That's how they lived. So now we can understand that when we find Paul saying, don't let that be mentioned amongst you because you now a Christian. That life doesn't belong to you. The people that do those things, the wrath of God, the End and destruction is for them. What will ha what happened in in the time of of I, I did start the clock there. Thank you, my love. Um, what happened in the time of Noah? That destruction, that end, is what is waiting for this world system, and you as Christians have been removed from that. The order of heaven is now for your body, thank God, is not available anymore for that painful, destructive way of living. Sex has now been purified. It has now become something beautiful inside the parameters of Christianity. I saw this uh, this humorous thing that was on um, on Facebook. The person says, said, marriage before sex is not a sin. <laughs> marriage before sex is not a sin. It's not wrong. It's not to be mocked. It is good. It's holy. It talks about Christ. We can make our bodies available. Young people can say, we make our, vo our bodies available to show the union that there is between us and Christ. And so the order of heaven comes to earth. It's basically heaven coming to earth. Isn't that beautiful? It's absolutely beautiful. So in Rome... Um, it, it was they were very sexually promiscuous and it was accepted it was accepted now opposed to roman acceptance of these ways was christian marriage it was against that it showed another way if we think of sexual purity yeah i mean there were just so many scriptures uh where Paul comes, and now let me just read one of them. It says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Thus each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and in honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who know not God. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 to 20, Flee from sexual immor immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of his body, but sexual immorality immoral person sin against his own body or do you not know that your body is the temple of the holy spirit so can you see what he's saying he says your body is the temple of the holy spirit and you are harming the very beautiful thing that you are isn't that just actually wonderful to see who we are and f knowing who we are from there uh, to live a life where we can basically say 
as I am not having sexual relationship with other women, but only with my wife, I am celebrating the union where God says he has union with me and I have union with him and that this body that I that I have is the place where the life of God now dwells in this earth. That is what he's saying. We find in Christianity, one of the things that they, um, I, I hope I, I jotted this down. Let me just see here quickly. I'm just going to say it while I remember it. One of the things they didn't practice, oh yeah, it is down. I did jot it down. I'll get to that. Um, they had an ethical treatment. Christians had an ethical treatment of slaves. You know, slaves were just owned by the Romans. You had a slave, it was your property. Again, when it comes to sex, they couldn't refuse. It's just, they were just abused and used. And it was not even seen as an abuse and a use. It was just seen as your right. It was normal. But what happened in Christianity? That was all ended in Christianity. The order of heaven of respect and love was shown. Um, it says here, uh, I've jotted this down, they were encouraged to be kind to their slaves. Ephesians 6, 9, masters do not do the do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that you that you have a master yourself which is in heaven and there's no partiality with him he loves the slave as much as what he loves you so he tells the masters you're going to not threaten your slave do you know how revolutionary that was in the time of rome you're not threatening your slave what does paul say paul comes to this conclusion he's saying that there's one master over the slave owner and the slave the, the slave owner had to be set free from sin and death, and the slave had to be set free from sin and death. Death was in the slave owner, and death was in the slave. That means they are the same. So salvation, Jesus came to be a Messiah to save people from sin and death. That puts the slave owner and the slave in the same boat. Now, he is giving the order of heaven to the people. And they say, well, slave owner, what do you do? You're going to treat him with respect. What does he do to say to the slave? He says, well, since you are serving the Lord, serve your master and be good to him. You know, love him. And he's just taking the order of heaven and bringing it into everyday life. That is heaven on earth. That is Matthew 6 being manifested. Our father, your kingdom come. That is, that is how your kingdom come looks. Right. Let me um, quickly look at... Just what was, uh, hospitality is one of the things, I mean, they were very hospitable, they loved the poor, they were actually praised by Rome that when there was a flood and when there was distress, that the Christians were the people that would take their possessions, sell it and help the poor and care for people. We find heaven coming to earth in the Christians. Um, then I want to just quickly mention what was written by um, in, in the epistle of Diognetus, and I'm going to end this. Diognetus was a Christian apologist that explained Christianity to one of the emperors or one of the, the Romans that wanted to know what Christianity is all about. This is how Christianity looked. Christians in the world, Christians live in their own countries, but as sojourners. In other words, they said Christians were a people that lived in this world, but they said that we are citizens of heaven. That is who they are. And I think that is who we need to know we are. We are citizens of heaven. Now, citizenship back then was a very big thing. It's a very, very big thing. You know, are you a citizen of Rome or not? If you were a citizen of Rome, you had certain privileges. So now they were saying, we are not citizens of Rome. We are citizens of heaven. That's how they lived. Well, Paul, when he was in jail, he would say, well, I am a Roman citizen as pertaining to the laws of the country to deal with a court case that he was busy with. But the way he lived was not as if he was a citizen of Rome. He lived as if he's a citizen of heaven. And he looked at the life of heaven demonstrated and he said, that is who I am. Now, that was not just a cognitive persuasion where he tried to change his life by changing his mind. No, it was a realization of the truth of what God was bringing forth in the earth. Uh, he writes here in his epistle to Diognetus, he says, they participate in all aspects of society, 
but they have a distinct moral and ethical practices. They obey established laws, but surpass them in their own personal lives. So they obey the laws of the country, but they are actually much more holy. They don't even need the law of the country because they are in their own lives holier than any law that we could give to them. That is who they are. Isn't that powerful? Christians display a unique way of life characterized by honesty, integrity, and love. They marry and have children, but do not practice infanticide. What that means is that the Christians were different to Rome. Why? Because if they had a children and that children was born crippled or with a defect, uh, they didn't put it on the side of the road to be eaten by the ravens. As Rome did, they said, this child of mine is the, is, is the image of God. And even if they cripple, even if they're sick, we're going to love them and care for them. And they would even go and adopt the Roman children from the streets into their own homes. Why? Because the order of heaven has shaped their minds and they became new in their way of thinking, standing separate from the world. And that is the power that the gospel has towards us. And that is what I'm available for and I know all of you are. They share their food, but not their spouses. Show moral purity and hospitality. Christians are persecuted, persecuted but they do not retaliate. They are misunderstood and maligned, yet they pray for their persecutors and seek peace. Christians consider themselves as citizens of heaven. They live in this world as if they were in a foreign land, focusing on spiritual rather than earthly matters. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? This is what was said about Christians. This is the life that Christians live. Why? Because of the order of heaven that came to earth. And this is the context wherein Paul was um, giving his advice on Christian living. And this is the advice that I give from this perspective. You know, if you're watching me and let's say you live together, you're not married, I want to tell you, don't you want to come together with your girlfriend or your boyfriend and say to each other, listen, the time has come for us to make our bodies available for the order of heaven, where we can say our bodies is there to show forth and celebrate the union of marriage that there is. Where the husband can say, the man can say, I am here to lay down my life for you. And where the lady would say, well, in our union that there is uh, between each other and in our union with Christ, since we are already one with Christ, we are saying, let your kingdom come, let your will be done in our relationship as well. Isn't that beautiful? Or if any one of you struggle with any kind of a sin where you can say, Lord, here is my body. Here is who I am, available for the order of heaven, where you come to your right mind as pertaining to this truth, and then where you submit your life to that rule of heaven, where you would find God brings forth a new life. And Paul calls that beneficial. He calls that a manifestation of life. He didn't say that from a condemning perspective. Paul preached from the perspective of heaven being established in earth. And so freedom comes to this world from the destruction that is in this world. Well, amen and amen. I've come to the end of my message today. Uh, isn't it beautiful to see what God has for us? I just feel so excited when I read these texts because if I look at the life that is demonstrated there, I can say if I find any place in my life where I have not uh, or where I'm not seeing that manifested, especially when he mentions, he mentions many things, you know, lie not to one another, do not, don't be angry, be anxious for nothing. Isn't that beautiful? Because we don't find anxiety in God. You know, now we can say, be anxious for nothing, pray for your uh, oppressors. One of the things that I didn't mention, one of the things that the, the, the early Christians did, they didn't take up the sword. They were completely different, where the Roman rule was about dominating through the in, we're going to take your life. The Christians didn't live like that. They were there to protect life. 
Isn't that beautiful? We are, that's what we can be, what God has made for us. He's offering us a life where we can live in this world and we so see no need to see another die so that our lives can be safe because we are safe in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? Well, glory to God. We've come to the end of the service. Um, yeah, thank you for slotting in. Let us just pray. Father, I want to thank you for your love and your grace. I want to thank you for your kindness. I thank you that we can know who we are. Thank you, Lord, that we are on this beautiful road of discovery on who we are, what your kingdom is, and how heaven comes to earth. Thank you, Lord, that we are at the place where we are welcoming heaven into our lives. And thank you that we can be a people that live in absolute victory because of the joy that you have brought to us in bringing the order of heaven to earth. I bless these people. I thank you, Lord, that as this message has touched them, that they are liberated in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. If you've, if you've watched this and you've watched this on YouTube, please give a big thumbs up there on my YouTube. Uh, put a like there. And if you want to share this with a friend, share it with them. This will be beneficial to many, many people. Thank you. And then we will chat again next Sunday. God bless.